Hello and welcome PML fans. I'm your host Joseph Moore here. Along with me I have Stuart J. Mills. Hello, how are we going? And we are here to bring you the PML Draft Center recap for week three of the PML Draft. Week three. Week three. They made it to week three. Look at us go. It's flying by. <laughs> it really is. And um, we will open up this week with again Stuart's favorite type of battle my battle versus the CF Cramorants I, I think that, see you. I think it's uh, New England Chartreuse versus the Central Florida Cramorants if I'm correct oh Central Florida I wonder what the CF stood for there you go well go ahead and lead us into that battle Stuart Right, so, you know, you're going to know when your battle is game of the week because it won't be first. Because we're just going to run with your battles being first. <laughs> it works. Um, so, for me, the moment of the match, it's pretty obvious, really. It's when uh, Life and Rock hits the Dynamax button and sweeps. Um, no surprise there. Didn't even, yeah, didn't even need the sand from Hippo, which was going to be a bonus for it, I guess. Didn't have to set up its own sand. But, um, yeah, sweeps, scrubs team. It was almost out of nowhere. It was like you were like, eh, going to give it a go from here. And so it happened. Yeah, I purposely um, made Lycanroc one point faster than Dracozolt in Sand. And um, I was tempted to run a Scarf Dragapult, but I changed it to a Choice Banded at the very last second. Ultimately, it didn't matter, really. Just uh, did, the, did the same job. It was fast enough. Yeah, it was fast enough without the sun yeah. up against Drake as well. Yeah, without the sand, yeah. So, um, team preview again. You uh, you were pretty happy? I I wasn't. He brought double poison, and I was not expecting it. Not expecting double poison. I was expecting wheezing. I was not expecting yeah. skunk tank, and that thing... Made me throw a fit in the middle of that battle. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. So, yeah, I could tell from the start that um, you know, you were, you were saying that you didn't expect Skunk Tank, and I knew that was going to be a problem because, as someone who's used Skunk Tank, um, it's got a lot in its toolkit that people don't realise, and it's surprisingly bulky too, which doesn't help. It's too um, bulky. And. Yeah, and if you don't prep for it, if you don't have some strong ground moves or whatever, you, you're going to be in trouble because uh, it'll just sit there. Especially if it's got Black Sludge or, you know, things like that. It's going to... You, you're not going to be able to get too much off on it and it's going to be recovering health while you're doing it. So, um, you know, it also has Defog, Sucker Punch, those kind of moves. And when you add that on top of the fact that it's surprisingly tanky, it's a problem to get down, and that's what happened with you. So, I mean, you led Skarmory against it, fair enough. You wanted to get up rocks. Um, you feared the fire move, but you clicked stealth rocks anyway, got the rocks up. Then you were like, oh, maybe it gets defog. I think it gets defog. <laughs> and so you rooted the damage off, which was which was a smart thing to do. What does it do with defog? So you're like, nah, screw this. I'm going to switch out. That is one of um, those weird minds that get defog that you would never expect, and it does so it's so weird that it did. Yeah, that's weird. I totally agree. And so once you're back at full health with Skarmory, you uh, switch out into Drapion. Um, Skunk Tank can't do much to you. You can't do much to Skunk Tank. So you Swords Dance while Weezing was sent in, uh, which I thought was interesting. I know that it's only neutral to Poison, but still they must have suspected at least a knockoff, if not an SD. Um, the neutral poison jab is still going to hurt at plus two, but I guess they just were that desperate to Willow Wisp you, so it kind of made sense in that respect. I'm surprised you didn't double sword stance, but it ultimately didn't matter. Um, yeah, I, was could, expect, yeah. I was expecting to just let it go down at that point. Yeah, yeah. so when you were um, sacking it, you just knock it off in front of the hip held on. Uh, you just get throwing moves at the hippos, it slacks off trying to get the poison, and it works. So you got the poison on it. You went down. Um, Skuntank comes in against Garmory again. It seems to be a switch in. It burns you, which means your 
your secret tech was uh, busted for the week with your sturdy counter. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, once you. again, yeah, once again, ultimately it didn't matter, but um, it would have been annoying at the time. Um, you send in Dragapult to get some momentum with U turn. However, that momentum is immediately stalled because Roserade has nothing force contact. So it just had to switch out. Um, Gastrodon killed Weezing with the Scald. Thwacky came out. Click U turn. You sacked Roserade at this point for a free switch to Dragapult. Regained some momentum with U turn. And we all know what happens next. It was GG. You just cleaned up the rest of the team with Lycanroc. Yeah, I mean, Lycanroc is has one job and it does it well. <laughs> so what? Killed Primarina. Um, Thwacky activated its weakness policy with Max Knuckle, which was like, I don't know if Max Grass would have killed, but um, it was definitely surprising he went for Max Knuckle. He obviously realized that he was behind, so had um, to maybe get that get that attack boost. So I did count it afterward. Uh, it had a chance to kill. Uh, well, it definitely would have killed with the health I had. So I, I'm grateful that he went for Max Knuckles instead. Yep, fair enough. Um, so Thwacky got demolished as well. And then Hippo went down, Skunting went down, and Dragazole went down. So, you know, finals of GG's to you. Use your three max turns well. Um, you probably still would have got through even if you hadn't had the weakness policy activated, but... Scrub had to try something because they were clearly on the back foot as soon as Black and Rock started cleaning up. So, yeah, big, big win. And uh, spoilers for later, but Black and Rock was definitely the MVP this week. Oh, Although, yeah. you know, it had some it had some close competition, but we'll get to that later. Five kills and no deaths. I mean, what, what can you do about that? And it's currently the kill leader of the season as well. Well, I'm not surprising. It has a, has it, yeah, it has had a big two weeks. Yeah, I think uh, four kills last week, five kills this week. So, I mean, there you go. You know what I'm Dynamaxing. <laughs> and then the next battle brings us to one of the newcomers here. It's the Pecatonica Fire Squirrels versus the Rebellion. Yes, so, uh, Shelby is uh, one of the new coaches that have joined the league. Um, I'm not quite sure which team she replaced. Do you know offhand? Um, she replaced uh, TD. Right. The Tory Cats. Right. The Tory Cats, yes. So, you know, she has a bit of work to do, but um, made her changes to the team, I'm sure. And, uh, oh, yeah. So the whole the, team. <laughs> yeah. She made 10 moves so, uh, of the 10 moves she was able to make. And um, it came good straight away. So um, for me, the moment of the match was Tauros' carnage at the start. Basically, just click buttons. Um, for me, it was a game-changing choice to Dynamax, despite having several stat drops. Um, yeah, pretty much ran away with it from there and had a convincing 3-0 win in the end. How did you feel when you were watching it? Um, it was amazing. Toros just came out and was like, I'm going to hit everything. I don't care what you have in front of me. I'm just going to swing. And the I think the turning point in that match started early when Toros came out and just max held when that Flygon came in. Because yeah, obviously was... the opponent did not expect that in any means. And there was no reason for the no, max hell storm other than to set up the... Uh, uh, the uh, what do you call it? Pokemon she had, um, Arctazolt. Arctazolt, yeah. There was no other reason to, to max Hellstorm at that point other than to set that thing up. And she set that thing up along with killing a Flygon, which definitely helped her case in that week. So it wasn't a, a predicted switch to Flygon? I don't think it was. It, it didn't seem like it was. And from what she said in her battle, it didn't seem like it was. So, yeah. I wouldn't say she knew that thing was coming in. I think she mainly wanted that hell so she could have that double speed. And just coincidentally, it it played out in her favor. Yeah, so um, 
of course, from the start, it was the, the, the farm animals, the bull versus the cow, and uh, Taurus almost Oko mill tank turn one with close combat. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, sheer force boosted close combat. You can't you can't underestimate how powerful that is. But uh, unfortunately, it didn't get the kill. So mill tank did get the stealth rocks up. Um, Lucian switches to Arcanine to get the Intimidate off as Shelby hit it with a rough side. Uh, and then switches straight back out to Celesteela, which also gets hit with a rock slide. And then this is where um, I thought was the interesting choice is that Shelby decided to uh, Dynamax Taurus right then, despite being minus one attack and minus one to both defenses. Um, didn't really care. Uh, Celesteela ate a Max Lightning and Leech Seeded Taurus, but um, Taurus just kept on clicking Max Knuckle against Celesteela when it's protected to return its attack to normal. And and then Taurus clicked Max Hailstorm, which as we know, completely obliterated Flygon off the face of the planet. And also um, set up the hail for Arkansas later on. And then when it wasn't Dynamax, Taurus clicked Wild Charge. Um, didn't look very rosy for Lucian at that stage. It wasn't until Nino King came in that it stopped the rock. Finally took out the Taurus, but obviously it had more than done its job. Um, you know, sometimes you Dynamax early, you feel like you've lost the game later on, but uh, definitely smashed a big hole. And uh, after Zolt came in for the few remaining turns of hail. Uh, she, definitely it was a broke, un- she definitely broke the rules. Hey. She definitely broke yeah. the rules in the fact that uh, the people who, who are like those who max turn one lose, she did not lose that match. Yeah. No, especially um Yeah, that's right. But those who max last win or whatever the whatever the saying is, but Yeah. It's unfortunate that her um after Mr. missed an ice ball crash on Mr. Ryan because it probably would have to it KO'd it. As um Mr. Ryan Dynamaxed and used Max Strike on Arctazot, which slowed it down. The Bolt Beak did 40% to Mr. Ryan despite it being Dynamaxed, so it showed how much how strong Arctazot was. But the uh, Arctazot was now slower than Mr. Ryan, and it was killed by Max Mindstorm. Uh, Max mm-hmm. Mindstorm came off on the du- Dust Nora <clears throat> as well. However, it got finished off by Poltergeist. Arcanine came in to intimidate Dust Nora. Morning Sun to regain the house, but even at minus one, Dust Nora still did 50% Arcanine, which kept on clicking Morning Sun. Oh, yeah. So Shelby took the opportunity to use Power Up Punch to restore its attack to even. Um, unfortunately for her, Flebits finished it off by Arcanine, and Arcanine was pretty close to full health still. It Wild Charged Blastoise for 90% as Blastoise took Shell Smash, and Shell Smash finished the game. It finished off Arcanine with a Scald. It blew back um, Neo King and it left that milk tank that was on one percent from the, the first turn to be Blastoise's final victim. So it was hugely convincing three zero win to the Fire Squirrels. Um, welcome to the league. Yeah, gonna play like that every week. You'll be top of the standings from the bottom in no time. That was a big fucking hello. <laughs> no doubt about it. Yeah, I'm not sure if because. Uh, her first battle was her first video on her channel, so there's no, not even any other matches to watch. So it was good. It was really good to watch. It was certainly an exciting one, and we hope to see more out of that bat, out of that team next week as well. Of course, she yeah, is obviously... uh, the wife of uh, Apparator Fifty Four, so uh, I've heard good things about her battle style, and uh, she certainly showed it in that first game. Yeah, well, obviously she's um, changed to a team that is more suited to her play style, which is good. Like, it's quite often tempting to, if you take over a team, to try to use the mons that are there. Mm-hmm. But obviously she's like, no, I'm going to um, change the Pokemon that I'm happy with. And it works. It worked so far. Turn one. Uh, match one, sorry. All right. Well, that brings us to our third match. That is the... Now we're hot to hoppers versus. Hey, you got it. You got it first try. Yeah, dude. I've been practicing all week. (laughs) You've been practicing. Nice. And. uh, Vegas City Jango, I believe it is. 
yeah the the vegas city jang moos and uh this is uh the vegas uh, the vegas club jang moos first week oh vegas club well there you go yeah <laughs> so for me the um turning point in this match was quite late on um it wasn't a, a particular point by any one particular pokemon but it was there were a few switches and then we had several ko's in a row um Ferrothorn took out the Cordelia with a body press, which is then taken out by Buzzwall, which is then killed by Charizard, which is then killed by Thievil. So those turns there, it was brutal. It was brutal to watch. Bang, 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 bang. All of a sudden, we went from we went from a super close time or game um, to a closer time or win. Probably would have ended the opposite way if it was the chess timer or if it was a uh, non-timer game, but Mm-hmm. It wasn't to be, and the the Vegas club JMO picked up a close win to start their campaign. Yeah, um, they 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 were a fill-in coach for Dusty Day Day Night. Sadly, um, they weren't able to uh, continue after that six zero win with Charizard, and because of that six zero win with Charizard, uh, the JMO coach inconsistency. He was like, fuck it, I'm going to keep Charizard. It had six kills. Like, why would I get rid of it? <laughs> so he yeah, made, a few, he made a few changes, yeah. but he kept the Charizard. Well, as we know, Charizard's got a pretty good position as far as uh, you know, being able to Dynamax and where it is in the draft. So <laughs> quite useful to have on the team as a flying fly type. Oh, definitely. And um, he was... He was also wondering how Charizard got those kills because obviously he was new to the draft. And once we told him, he was like, oh, yeah, I'll never run that kind of set with dot, dot, dot. <laughs> so you never know. We might see a, a belly drum Charizard again later this season. Oh, that'll be crazy. So this match started off um, a bit slowly with the uh, t- with Tentacle and Ferrothorn out. Um, the Hoppers actually predicted the Ferrothorn lead, but expected the Ferrothorn to set up hazards, which of course it didn't. It clicked knock off turn one. Uh, Tentacruel set up a layer of T-spikes, and uh, JMO immediately sent in hit one top to rapid spin the spikes away. However, knowing that they were going to rapid spin, the Hoppers switched into Rocky Helmet Buzzwall, and combined with the Drain Punch damage and poison, hit one top was worn down quite quickly, which is the problem with hit one top. It doesn't have any kind of um, healing ability other than leftovers so another great prediction was when the charizard was coming in and the hopper sent out concalda uh concalda was carrying rock two which would not only be four times super effective but also slow charizard down however um the hoppers knew that their concalda would be able to survive a max air stream however the charizard clicked air slash not dynamaxed and what does it do? It flinches Concalda, so it doesn't even get to use the tech um, that they brought. So that was an unfortunate turn of events for the Hoppers. Mm-hmm. Um, they decided to, they decided to save Concalda. They switched it out, sent Tentacruel back out, which is also matched by him on top coming out on the fresh set of T spikes. And however, Tentacruel was faster, switching to him on top was essentially sacking it it was sacking him one time so it didn't get to get the rapid spin off the second time so the um gmo sent in tyrantrum and you know it's one of those mons where if you let it get away on you it can do some damage it clicks dd first turn despite being poison um it kills the tentacruel but it's left on about 50 percent at the time mm-hmm. even even despite that it decided they decide to dynamax so it takes out the counter that comes in which opted not to click mock punch um, the Hoppers have no choice at this stage but to reveal their Scarf Garchomp, and it kills the Tyrantrum, wasting its Dynamax turns. However, this does give Charizard the free switch in. But I still think it was worth it because that Tyrantrum would have um, hurt that Garchomp if it clicked anything else. Yeah, you ain't lying. And then... Yeah. That could be a dangerous Pokemon. So... Exactly. Especially because um, the Hoppers knew they had Credilly to come in basically came in for free on Charizard and ate whatever it could be thrown at it. Uh, Tyrantrum had used max rockfall, so the sand was up. 
and that gave the special defense boost to an already defensive Credilli. So it ate a few uh, ate a few hits, and it was another great prediction from the Hoppers as they switched to Br- Buzzwell predicting Ferrothorn, and that's exactly what happened. <laughs> After a drain punch, Buzzwell took some residual damage, of course, and is toxic by Ferro. Not ideal. So, um, eventually, Charizard comes back in, and the Hoppers are willing to sack Buzzwell at this point, and then the cycle repeats with Credilli coming in. Um, it stays in this time though, and Charizard lands a Fire Blast while Credilli misses a Rock Blast, which is a big moment as well. Because mm. they Rock Blast, even with two hits, it would have choked it. Um, so they have to send out Zerkatry. It takes the Poison, it takes two Rock Blast hits. It hits a Hypnosis first try, which um, the Hoppers are actually glad about because I think they were worried about it being Blunder Policy <laughs> or something along those lines. Um, they also predict the incoming Garchomp and hit it with a Dazzling Gleam. Of course, the team was a little bit worried that uh, the Hoppers were a little bit worried that it was going to tail glow. Yeah. So they were happy yeah. to take the Dazzling Gleam on the Garchomp, I think. I mean, yeah, you never know when uh, Zerkachi just wants to fucking boost and let loose. Exactly right. So then we get towards the moment of the match that I was talking about where there's a few more switches and then Ferrothorn takes out Cordelia with body press, um, which is then taken out by Buzzball, which is then killed by Charizard, which is then killed by Siebel. Um Siebel decided not to match straight away and it takes a big hit from Swampert there where it's... Um, yeah, I don't know what- it officially sealed the deal for the Hoppers, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, they went for the flint, which is fair enough, makes sense. But I think if getting off a couple of max turns, max moves would have probably been a better deal there. But um, it can't take out, can't kill Ferrothorn and gets taken out. So ultimately, the timer made the decision on this one. Did GMO hold on, killing Seawall after it maxed, and it left the Hoppers with just, uh, just Garchomp. It was an unfortunate end to the match. It was a great match. And if it was on the chess timer, I definitely think they would have won with Scarf Garchomp. However, it wasn't the B. And that's a GG to the Jane Mato. Hey, you win some, you lose some. And lucky for the Jane Mato, they won some on their first entry into the game. Exactly right. And then with that that brings us to our next battle the chicago chunks versus the new orleans and Fernapes. <laughs> right so this is danny's redemption match after last week he was um, obviously not on his game and he'd be the first to admit that and he wasn't happy with the result mm-hmm. um he made it he made a trade of uh not fully evolved starter to not fully evolved starter with Torcat being traded to reboot and he brought reboot this match and unfortunately for him the moment of the match is when a freshly boosted reboot misses a high jump kick after maxing um it probably would have swept at that point it was plus two attack plus one speed but it died to its own height it died to its own high jump kick recoil and for me that was the moment of the match that definitely changed the momentum of that match that 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 Um, because that red boot could have finished that game right then and there Exactly, and it probably would have been, uh, what was it at that stage, a 4 0 or a 3 0? But um, it ended up being a 4 0. Yeah, so it would have ended up, it would end up being a close uh, 1 or 2 0. I think it was a 1 0 at the end there with Dragonite. But um, yeah, pretty close game and uh, didn't need to be. But I give but it to Melvin. Game. I mean, he took advantage of that high jump kick miss and he pulled it back. He almost came out That's with that right. win. That's right. Exactly right, and it was it shows that you just don't give up. And uh, we put, this is the game we play, and hacks is gonna happen. You're gonna get fully parried, or you're gonna miss ninety five percent accurate moves. And some days that works for you, and some days it doesn't. You take the good with the bad, and it's just uh, important not to go on tilt and start sacking things when you don't need to. <laughs> and, that, and and you know what? I think that's what Danny did best. He didn't tilt. He just was like, "All right, we can overcome this." Yeah. And because exactly right. he could have tilted, and the New Orleans Ape, Infern Apes could have won that, could have swept that game, and came out with the win. But Danny's expertise in battling, he he was able to overcome that miss, and he was able to take that win. Exactly right. So <laughs> this match started off. Um, Danny borders his lead, Azumarill, which is the defensive whirlpool 
Pura's trap set. He didn't expect Mimikyu to be the lead, but it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, he makes a point of saying at the start, like he's going to use Whirlpool to break the disguise. It's not to trap Mimikyu because it can't be trapped because it's ghost type. Whether Melvin knew that or not, I'm not sure. But um, Mimikyu straight away used Wither Wisp because it would have expected a, you know, a belly drum or a, yeah. a banded hit of some kind. Um, but Arju breaks, breaks the disguise with that Whirlpool. Um, they exchange play rough and scold, um, doing good damage to each other. And then Azumarill reveals that it's Resto Chester. So, and heals up, gets rid of the burn, but Mimikyu just burns it straight away before it, before it goes down. Mm -hmm. So it was an interesting, it was an interesting start. I, yeah, you can't fault Melvin for using Mimikyu in that way. So, because if, if Azumarill had Belly Drum or something, it could have been GG from the start. Oh, definitely. However, yeah. Um, Melvin, yeah, but, sorry, you go. I was going to say, I, I give Melvin that the fact that um, he may not have known Ghost doesn't get trapped by Whirlpool just because Whirlpool is Whirlpool. And when you face that kind of team, when you face that kind of set, you, you're just like, oh, okay, fuck. Well, I got to just <laughs> ride it out. Hit, so Exactly. Hit, hit, hit what's in front of me. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I give him that. Uh, Obviously, he's a very good battler, but he might not have just known that specific set. So, yeah, well, to, to be honest, no in a battle, that. I probably wouldn't remember it. Yeah, in battle, unless I knew it in advance and had thought about it, I wouldn't have considered it really. I wouldn't have um, gone, oh, I'm not trapped. But mm -hmm. um, so after Mimiki goes down, he brings in Gudra and. Then he switches to Volplume because it's very especially bulky, or very bulky full stop to mm -hmm. take the Thunderbolt. It, then he then doubles to Kangaskhan, which he, you know, it's his the same wish protects Kangaskhan. Um, was it the wrong Kangaskhan? Is, did he mention that? Yeah, he did mention that it was yeah. not special defensive as he wanted. Uh, yeah. His uh, team builder buddy that he normally talked to talked him into going full physically defensive. And that that apparently that did affect his uh, Kangaskhan in that battle. Yeah. So the problem for that is that he didn't predict a Magma to come into the battle at all due to all the fire resists and things that it could be killed with. But um, of course, Melbourne did bring Magma, so knowing that it's going to be a special attacker, and he's got his non specially defensive Kangaskhan out in front of it, mm -hmm. he protects the he protects the first turn. Just to see what uh, Magmort is going to do. And then sacks Azumarill just to waste a couple of those Dynamax turns. And this is where he brings in his Reboot. And so Reboot comes in at Max Knuckles first, and then at Max Airstreams to be plus one, plus one, mm -hmm. which uh, the Max Airstream kills Magmort. And so Melvin brings Kudra back in. He then uh, takes the Max Knuckle. And Reboot misses its high jump kick. He even says, we have really to sweep, and no, wasn't to be. So um, it was an unfortunate turn of events for Danny. Reboot, obviously, it's Cinderace Light. It's the, the baby version, so it has all the bells and whistles. It doesn't get Pyro Ball, I don't believe, but it gets everything else. It still has Libero, so um, it would have been very painful taking a max... Uh, sorry, taking a stab high jump kick. However, it didn't. If so I'm correct, it, it, was still, good... it still does get the pyro ball. Does it? Oh, well, yeah. there you go. So much I know. Um, but even without it, it was a good good debut for Reboot. Um, Danny brought in Weavile, killed Guja with knockoff. However, the Weavile was slowed down by Gooey. This is important because it means that Weavile isn't faster than Chinchino when it comes in. However, Danny bought Volplume specifically for Chinchino. It's max defense, bold, rocky helmet. Yeah. So if it, if it uses any contact move, it's going to take be punished by the rocky helmet. And Danny so, did get to get a, chunk of, get a chuckle out of that when exactly, even triple action. Exactly right. So it that. survived five tail slaps, which absolutely destroyed Chinchino to the point where it could only get two triple axle actual hits off before uh, the rocky helmet actually did the job. So Wolfram didn't even have to click and move. <laughs> yeah. It was just like, you know what? I'm here. I'm just going to take the hits and let's go. 
<laughs> exactly right. So um, Togekiss then revenges it and sets up a nasty plot in front of the face of the Kangaskhan as it clicks Wish. It then survives a plus two aura sphere despite it not being especially defensive. It obviously was bulky enough to hit it, to live it. Mm-hmm. And it hit Togekiss for 40% with Rock Slide. Um, Danny said that's probably weakness policy, and sure enough, weakness policy comes off. Togekiss kills Kangaskhan with Air Slash, but uh, isn't here on Stagan versus the Weavile who clicks Ice Shard. So there's no way Melvin could have known that Weavile didn't have Icicle Crash or Triple Axel or you know something to hit it like that. So it actually would have survived the Ice Shard, but it lost all its boost by switching out and by switching into Mammoth Swine. Danny says it gets splattered by a low kick, which it does. It gets absolutely destroyed by a, a uh, low kick, and then Togekiss has to come back in unboosted. It lives the ice shard as it would have initially, and then kills with Aura Sphere. Um, you can't help but feel switching out ended any chance he had of winning. So um, Dragonite cleans up with that strength speed in the final minute of the match for a non-timer win to Danny. He'll be happy with that. Yeah, a clean 1-0 is nothing to be ashamed of. And it certainly boosted his uh, ranking on um, the overall ranking for the division. That's right. So a win's a win, and we take those any way we can get. And uh, right now is a good time to mention that he, the Crushing Solvali versus Memphis Munchlax was not able to be played in time for this video. Um, we did have to get a replacement for the Memphis Munchlax, which we did. Um, it's Alice the Ferrothorn. They were able to take over the team, but not in time for us to make this video. So we won't be exactly reflecting that battle in the in this week or next week's video but the stats will still be provided in the standings as we go forward so just know that um we we do know that the replacement for the memphis munchlax were able to overcome the crunching savali the crushing savali but uh as the records will reflect right now, it shows that the Crushing Savalis had the forfeit win over the Memphis Munchlax, which will be adjusted later on. But um, <clears throat> just know that that the Memphis Munchlax are going to be much higher than the record shows currently. Yeah, if you want to check on it at a later time, briefly, if you remember. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> But that brings us to our next battle. Um, the McChesney Park Slowpokes versus the Wiki Waki Wishy Washies. Oh, you got you got a first try here as well. Gotta gotta do it, man. Gotta keep practicing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. All right, so how do you feel about this match? Oh, it was an amazing match. It was very it was very interesting to say the least. Apparator was very praising of Lily. Lily was just kind of going with the flow, and it, it was an interesting battle, no doubt. Who who brings Rain and Trick Room in the same week? You got to be surprised by that. Gotta say it was pretty entertaining. Um, Lily's battle was happy, pretty entertaining. She's very much a, uh, I'm gonna do this. Don't think too much about it. Just click buttons, which is good. I think that's a good way to be. Mm-hmm. But um, for me, the moment of the match was when. Uh, Sigilyph came in and it blew everyone back. Yeah. So, Sigilyph was yeah. not playing around. So, um, the slow folks were able to um, just pick up a, a nice victory there. It was, a, it was a close win, I guess you could say, but it was a convincing win all the same with uh, Sigilyph doing the business. It was a close win, but it was a dominating close win at the same time. Um, Trick Room did play a part, but <clears throat> Lily thinking that Belly Drum was special was certainly an interesting uh, concept. In yeah, battle. yeah. What was up with that? What was up with that? I mean, I mean, I'm, I can understand. I guess if you haven't come across it very often, but yeah, yeah. If you are prepping a team against a team that has Snow Puff or any other Belly Drummer, you kind of know that what it's going to do, like just from a little bit of research. But as with uh, the Aqua Jet's getting demolished by 
Belly Drum Charizard last week. Once you get, <laughs> once you see, once you see Belly Drum once, you'll always think about it. You'll always consider it in your team builder. Oh, definitely. And you know, everyone else in uh, the Galar division are looking out for uh, lead Belly Drum Slurpuff because. I know the week before the Machesney Park Slowpoke led it with sticky webs and had no intention of belly drumming at all. So, I mean, that could have caught Lily by surprise in that aspect, but you never know. Well, yeah, that's the problem with Slowpuff is that is it going to be Focus Sash, sticky webs, Misty Explosion? Is it going to be belly drum? Is it going to be something else? But, um, so the Slowpoke led Slowpuff, as we said, and Lily led Zatu. Um, maybe predicting sticky webs that could bounce them back or whatever mm-hmm. um the slowpokes a parader mentioned that he was surprised that Slipo, uh, that zatu even came to the match but um lily obviously had a little plan for it so the turn one belly drum was followed by the trick room by the zatu which is why it came along of course slurp up is still at plus six so when snorlax got switched in it stood no chance i don't know what i would have done in the same situation if we would have just sacked zatu or so maybe sacking Zatu and then maxing Snorlax might have been the go or something like that. Can Snorlax max? No, it's tier two, uh, so then no, it's tier two, so it can't. But um, yeah. I mean, fair enough on her part. She thought it was special. I mean, yeah, Snorlax is very special defensive. Like, of course, she was gonna bring that in. But it, I'm sure if she knew that it was physical, she would have probably put a uh, Rhyperion. It might have taken that uh, <coughs> fairy move much better and maybe max earlier in that match and you never know what could have happened but we, we we're not here That's to speculate right. we're just here to report That's right so Politoed sets up the rain um but more importantly for Lily it takes out the slurp puff with a mm-hmm. rain boost and scald. Um a predator at, at first thought it might be specs or at least offensive which was probably offensive but it wasn't specs because it he sends it he, because he sends in Serena next turn and uh, it eats an ice beam and Grassy Glide the Politoed into the red. Grassy Glide was a great bring. I um, I was actually thinking, I wonder if this gets Grassy Glide when I saw it on team preview with the Rillaboom, but uh, since the terrain wasn't set up, of course it doesn't get priority, which is a shame. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, there's a double switch to Scizor and Rillaboom, so they're off facing each other and Rillaboom immediately switches back to Politoed uh, and Scizor misses a Toxic. He was a little bit worried that um, she was going to send in Zatu and it's going to bounce the Toxic back, but of course Scissor was immune anyway, so it wasn't like it was a it was a no-loss play, really. Yeah. Um, Scissor then survived the Scald from the Politoed and didn't get burnt either, so it killed Politoed with the U-turn. Great choice to click U-turn, gave all the momentum back to him. Um, sends in Silvali Water to face the Kendra, who is going to run out of rain turns quite quickly because uh, Politoed is now dead. Mm-hmm. Um, he correctly predicts Serena switch in with a light full ice beam. Uh, I'm oh, sorry, Lily pr- correctly predicted it, and uh, it snaps off some of the damage with Grass to Glide while it could, but then died to a second ice beam. Scissor also um, hit off some damage with Bullet Punch for the same reason, just to knock it down before it too died to Kingdra. And you're like, oh, middle of the match, very even. You're thinking, you know. Those early gains made those early gains made by the slow pokes are being clawed back by Kingdra here. Okay. However, a Prater brings in Sigalif, which is his trump card this match. Uh, clicks the Dynamax button. The Max Airstream kills Kingdra. It uh, clicks Max Overgrowth uh, on Rhyperia. It's carrying grass move just for this Pokemon. It's absolutely obliterated. It's sent back to the Shadow Realm. Um, it was I would have been shocked to see. I mean, that's the problem with Rhyperia. It's got two very common uh, types that it's four times weak to. Yeah. Even with Solid Rock, it wasn't going to be living this. Uh, Lily's last ditch effort was to trick room with Zatu before it Dynamaxed. However, it was so low on health at this point. It, it doesn't do much with a Max Starfall. Um, yeah. Siglyph doesn't kill it with a Dazzling Gleam. And then a Max Mindstorm does another 40%, which means it leaves Rillaboom against Siglyph and Silvali. Lily had to make a play, basically, and predict the signal of switch with a sword stance. I don't know if I would have just gone, oh, I'm going to try and click Grassy Glide twice. Maybe, I know it's resisted against signal lift, but it's a real boom, and it was quite low on health. Yeah. Would have been interesting to see the calcs. Would have been interesting to see the calcs on that, because it could have, 
it could have cost the match. I didn't do the counts. I don't know. Um, however, of course, well, the signal from, doesn't switch. Well, from what I remember, and, there wasn't much trick room turns left. And Nagano Del wasn't going to die to anything the Rilly Boom had at that point. So it, it, it might have just lowered the Sigilith? differential a little bit. Well, Sig Sigilith might have died, but um, the Nagano Del definitely. You meant Sigilith, not Nagano Del? No, I'm saying uh, Sigilith might have died. Sigilith. <laughs> but, not um, Nagano Del. Sigilith. Well, there was still a Nagano Del in the back. That's why I'm saying even if si Sigilith. Oh, no, Savali was in the back. I could have sworn there was he didn't bring the gun down. No, nah, it was Savali, it was Savali water. Oh, okay. No, uh, I thought it was anyway, dragon. It was a dragon, it, it was something that they maybe it was that he they were saying it looked like water, that's why they were hoping. They oh, right, that's it. that's that's what threw me off there, yeah. But yeah, at but, that um, point, at that it point, doesn't, yeah, you know, it might have lowered differential, but I don't think it would have won them the game. No, so anyway, it clicks to a dance. Um, Sigilith doesn't switch. Death Slash doesn't miss, and Rillaboom goes down. So that's GG to a Proto in the McKesney Park Slowpoke. So it's a convincing yet close victory over the Wishy Washy. Yeah, it's definitely a close match. Obviously, uh, the Wiki Waki Wishy Washies are a fan favorite because of the name and because of the coach. But uh, Machesney Park Slowpoke's experience just trumped it. And, you know, we move on to the next week. <laughs> yeah, we do. I've been really impressed with the praise battling, um, even since week one. So I expect to see him at the pointy end of the season at this stage. Yeah. And we'll discuss where they stand at the end of this video. Um, but that brings us to our next battle, which was a doozy nonetheless that was team tempest versus the new york aqua jets one of the best names in this seat in this league honestly yes so um this is a was a great match alex and here we go heron tongs um for me the moment of the match was just marowak just I'm, i wrote in my notes running shot he was just walking everyone's ass it was great to see um a lot of marowak not a huge favorite of mine but um, under Trick Room, you can't get much better. Yeah. And this proved it. This proved it here. So that was that was the moment of the match for me. In, in this in this battle, it was um I know Fraz Hisby has done draft league battles and Team Tempest has done plenty of draft league battles. So I feel like this was um Team Tempest over predicting what New York Aqua Jets would do and New York Aqua Jets <laughs> were just like, I'm just gonna fucking swing. Like, I let's go. I 100% agree. So, I mean, um, Alex has been in the league for two weeks. Both times he's led Whimsicott. Both times he's clicked Trick Room turn one. Um, obviously, the lead was Cinderace versus Whimsicott, which you would think was is an ideal. However, Whimsicott had a focus sash, so it would have lived any attack from Cinderace. So it stays in, clicks Trick Room turn one for the third week in a row, second week in a row. Cinderace, you turns out to Dusclops, predicting this. Mm -hmm. uh, Whimsicott then mementos out because it's got prankster, so um, it, it dies, reduces the stats of Dusclops, which reveals Nightshade, so it didn't matter that it had lowered stats. Mm -hmm. um, Alex Maxis has a little Marowak out the gate. As soon as it comes in, it takes 50 HP damage from the Nightshade, which of course does the same amount of damage as your level. Yeah. And then it obliterates, the Dusclops gets obliterated by a Max, Fan Max Phantasm, so um that's a good a good start from uh alex and aqua jets here getting a kill quite early on um kiwi realizes that he has to max noise going to counter it which is lucky because the max phantasm that it takes did 75 percent even though it was dynamax there's no way he would have survived otherwise um the max wormwind in turn loves marowak's attack and then he switches out the uh noise leaving it on a little bit of health to Rotom Wash to take the last hit, uh, which still does 50% even at minus one attack. So that shows you how strong Sick Club a lot of Marowak is that it does that much to a Rotom Wash even at minus one. Yeah, it, and it, after it that, definitely interesting sight to see. You, yeah. 
So the trick remains there. Um, Alex switches to Salamence protecting the Hydro Pump um, on his fire type, which is what comes out from Rotom. It does, you know, 25% or whatever to Salamence. Mm-hmm. Who then uh, puts that, he puts that Rotom out of its misery with a Draco Media. It was a free switch for Kiwi to Dalmanitan after that, which, you know, Salamence clearly can't stay in on. Uh, Alex switches Marowak as Dan U turns into Noivern. So. Alex then switches in Pile of Swine, which easily tanks an air slash. Uh, Kiwi must predict the ice move and sends Darm in again. However, Alex clicks Stone Edge and that hurts yeah. Darm. Um, Darm's U turns out again. Yeah. Pile of Swine is very, very good as a low tier low tier pick. It's surprisingly often, I think it's got 100 base attack, which is quite a lot for, for a low tier mod. Mm-hmm. Um, one that's defensive with Evia Light. You know, um, stealth rocks and things like that. Um, got, so, Dom, you turns out again. Sorry. I, I, I was going to say, I got to admit, there was some plays with Pilot Swine where I was just like, dude, just attack. When he would just go bulk up. And obviously, I didn't know what I was talking about because those bulk ups paid off and ice shards and icicle crashes and stone edges just paid off at the end. So. Like, kudos to Tippy yeah. on that. Yeah, so he um, eats the U-turn from Darm and clicks Curse, which was a great play, predicting the U-turn again. Mm-hmm. Kato comes in. Uh, Alex wants to see how much damage an ice shard does at plus one. It does about 50%, so once he gets leftovers, it's not going to be a two at KO. And Kato sets up rocks. Pile of Swine takes almost nothing from an Earth Power because Kato's weak. Yeah. And sets up another curse, and now it's plus two. Ice Shard finishes off the Kaidol, and then incredibly, it lives an Iron Head. Of course, it's a stab Iron Head from Cinderace, mm-hmm. and Oko's it with EQ, which was huge. It was huge that it lived that EQ, uh, that Iron Head on seven. Yeah. Um, Dimantan lives the plus two Ice Shard, of course, because it resists, but uh, it was all the damage that was needed as it finally killed the Pilot Swine. Um, Mantine lived the Icicle Crash and kills Darn before Alex runs down the timer. It was really weird. He had time to click a move at the end there, but the last, like, 30 seconds, he just flicked between t- his team and the, <laughs> the battle. So, yeah. I mean, the game was done anyway. He'd, he'd won the game anyway. I don't know what the difference is between a 4-1 and a 3-1, or a th- it could have been a 3-0 if he had clicked a move. But uh, anyway, it was 4-1 timer. It was a big comeback from Alex after last week's loss. So... Yeah, you got to say GG, especially against a player as good as Kiwi has proven to be. Oh, yeah. Kiwi was undefeated until that point. So, I mean, it, cert- it certainly puts a blemish on his record and adds some credibility to uh, Fraz Tippy's team. That's 100% right. And um, once again, still, you know, not quite halfway through the season, so... Plenty of time for each team to make a push towards the playoffs. Oh, yeah. Plenty of time left. I mean, Kiwis only lost one game. Akujits uh, lost two games, and they have one win. So they got plenty of climbing to do. I mean, th- th- this is all, this is what PML is all about. I- any coach can win at any time, any given Sunday. And <laughs> Exactly right. And we are ready to see what happens in week four. But before that, we still got to talk about one last game this week and that is the right. Arizona Cardinals versus the Virginia Big Teenies, which is our game of the week now I was a little bit a little bit naughty here I made this the game of the week before watching the battle solely because of where they were on the table <laughs> and solely because of the history the history between these two battle, battlers and I mean yes it wasn't the closest match ever but the fact that there was you know a personal rivalry riding on it and the fact that it was top of the table clash like i said um, both for overall and for the gala division uh it was game of the week for me and the moment of the game of the week was the look eject button tech I i'm sure if anyone who's watched the battle they would have been surprised by that being moment of the match but there we are yeah you ain't lying i mean uh they're brand new to the pml draft league scene and we still know about their history about their rivalry and they're talking about how uh, uh, the Cardinals were like we haven't beat 
Mike in so long, and Mike has just yeah. been down our throats, and we're ready to <clears throat> give it back to him. And the Cardinals yeah. were able to pull that game out. Yes, um, yeah, like I said, they've been battled for many, many years. My Mike said in his video they've been battling since June six. So what's <laughs> yeah. that? Like seven or eight years ago now. Doesn't feel like that long ago, but it is. That's fucking um, history. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Horizon Gaming said that the wins against Mike weren't common for him, so it was a big game, and man, it did not disappoint. Uh, it didn't let me down as far as um, hype was concerned, so that was good, and um, the secret tech was revealed at Team Preview where he said that Golo had an eject button, and the plan was to take a U-turn from Firamosa and be forced out by the eject button so he could bring in Blaziken. Mm -hmm. Of course, for those of you who aren't aware, if you you turn into an eject button, it basically cancels your U-turn. You do the damage, but you can't switch. And um, that mon is forced to stay in. He's then going to block the Protect on Blaziken and Sword Stance as Firamosa hopefully switches out. So we get into the battle proper. Um, the prediction is that Archeops is going gonna, is gonna to be the lead, maybe Firamosa. So Starmie's the lead here. And um, no ground type for Starmie means it could just click thund Thunderbolt for free, which it does. Um, Archeops in turn knocks off the life orb and Stami then goes, well, what's going to switch in here? I'm going to throw for Ice Beam and what switches in? Mandibuzz. What happens to Mandibuzz? Frozen. <laughs> I think it was the second week in a row. Mandibuzz just loves being frozen. Mm. Maybe it needs to start, you know, what are you going to do? Carry a, a Lumberry or something? But man, that's rough two weeks in a row. You should just be in a um, at this point. Exactly right. Um, Stami then finishes it off with a Thunderbolt. So what does uh, what does Mike do? He sends out a scarf for Hermosa. And this is where the tech comes into play. He switches in Golurk on the Feromosa's U-turn. The Golurk switched out by the eject button. is forced to stay in. And Blaziken comes in. So Mike mentions in the video, oh, this is going to be bad if he clicks SD, but I'm just going to protect the, the protect. Mm -hmm. And he switches into uh, Slowbro. Switches into Slowbro. Blaziken does click Swords Dance. And all of a sudden, you've got a plus two Blaziken, and it's lucky that the life orb was knocked off because uh, there was a chance the slow bro would live. Um, apparently, the calc was 50% chance to Oko was See, knocked that, off, but it lived on four HP. See that that was the big that was the biggest play of the match. If he would have just clicked Scald, he yeah. might have been able to knock out that blaze again and avoided that sweep. But he decided to go for the trick. And but, um, oh, obviously, yeah. after he clicked that, obviously, button, he decided it's a trick. Yeah, yeah, after he clicked that button, he was like, Well, I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure he says that that match is GG because, um, having the lagging, lagging tail would have been horrible for Blaziken, obviously, it would have eliminated all the speed boosts. Um, Mike calls the game as a GG at this point, and so it was. Most of it was destroyed by Blaziken, Archeops, Heracross. Heliolisk, even Max Heliolisk couldn't survive plus two Blaziken. I don't know if it was dry skin or not, but dry skin wouldn't have helped. <laughs> yeah, to, to be honest, to be fair, the Virginia Victinis might have never seen that knockoff coming, which it didn't seem like they did. Yeah. And the Arizona Cardinals yeah. had great prep in that aspect. That's right, that's right. Either way, Blaziken goes down to recoil, which um, unfortunately robbed it of MVP status for the week. But uh, what a show it put on. Um, Mike was understandably in shock. Happily, he was like, oh, well, he's my mate. It's all good. GG. But, um, you know, <laughs> what do you do after you're just being blown back? What, what do you do after you've been blown back like that? There's nothing you can do. So yeah. just yeah. pick yourself up. <laughs> That's definitely the thing. And apparently uh, Mike has said he used that tech against... Uh, horizon before so it's it, it seems like yeah he said, really he said that he had seen going on. which is good to see it's good to see that these people have come from outside pml to a pml league and still have the same i don't know um they i guess have competition fire and energy Com right? yes yeah, that's, that's right the competitive nature yes yeah, so it's good to see and yeah i think despite the fact it was a blowout it was still worthy of game of the week like i said if you watch both sides of the battle, you can see the, how much it meant to both of them. So it was good. Oh, yeah. It, it was a great battle. And, again, what what more can you say about it? I mean, 
that was great tech, great, great setup, and Blaziken was just able to blow through it. And speaking of so much MVP status going around this league right now, we <laughs> do have to talk about this week's MVP. And of course that, we do. That why, is... why, why, why we just... Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, maybe we should just skip over the MVP this week. <laughs> no, we got to talk about it. We got <laughs> yeah. to talk about Mike and Rock midday with the Lock five and kills. And the only difference between Mike and Rock and Blaziken was Mike and Rock had no death. Blaziken had a death. Even though it was a self death, it was still a death. And uh, luckily, I got to get an MVP this season, which hardly ever happens. Hardly ever happens. I know the feeling. So, yeah, I mean, everyone knows Like Rock Dusk is probably the most well known and popular Like and Rock form, especially in Draft League. But the fact that you can Dynamax Like and Rock midday, take advantage of the sand, you know, it's got Excel Rock, it's got a lot going for it. So, it's good to see it at the top of the standings. I believe it's a kill cool leader now, too. Yeah, it's officially the co-leader. Uh, Charizard was played in that uh, for technically forfeit, but obviously that's going to change. That battle was played out. Uh, the replacement coach did win, but Charizard only got one kill and it also had one death. So it's not the co-leader anymore. <coughs> Lycanroc is at the top with nine kills total for the season so far. And the, the New England Chartriots have the lead for MVP with Lycanroc Midday with five kills this week. And I got to give credit to Stuart because if it wasn't for Stuart using D-Max, uh, Lycanroc, and TPL a few seasons ago, I would have never really thought about using Lycanroc Midday that way because Lycanroc Dusk is my favorite form of Lycanroc. You make do with what you can get. Yeah, you make do. <laughs> and that brings us <laughs> to our standings this week. Now, Stuart, you should be able to see those now in PMs. And uh, we will go over Kanto side real quick. And uh, the standings there are Kanto side. We have the New England Chartriots sitting at 2-1 and one with a plus 7 differential. The Vegas Club Jangmo O sitting at two and one with plus two differential. Uh, Chicago Chonks sitting at two and one with zero differential. Team Tempest at two and one with negative three differential in fourth place. The Naruhata Hopper at fifth place with one and two with a plus one differential. Why wow, you got right twice in the same video? Yeah, I got it right. I got to yeah. keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> the Central Florida Cramorant at 1 and 2 in 6th place with negative 1 differential. The New Orleans Infern Apes with 1 and 2 with negative 2 differential. And in last place in the Canto Division for now is the New York Aqua Jets at 1 and 2 with negative 5 differential. It is an I on three. Those standings. Yeah, it's, I mean, cream rises to the top, doesn't it, Joe? Top of the table. Um, I'm not used to this. It's very, no, <laughs> it's very, it's very close. It's very close. I think any, yeah, no one's out of the running yet, are they? No. So, I mean, oh, definitely not. There's, there's some big games coming up. Um, you want to get that top spot if you can. So, yeah, you just got to hold on for grand death now. Yeah, I mean, a winner loss can flip this, flip this rankings at any time. Normally, PML doesn't do rankings until week three. So, um, we've been doing it since week one for this season. So, it's completely different right now. It's crazy. To if see we run up to date. Yeah, it, it's really crazy to see how the rankings have changed so drastically. Uh, Chicago Chonks went from first to sixth to third. And the Chartriots, we went from 5th to 1st out of nowhere and it, 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 it's it's just crazy, I mean look at the Team Tempest going from 1st to 4th in just one week 
I mean, like I said, it's early on. It, once it gets to around week five or six, that's when it really cements itself. So uh, take take these rankings with a grain of salt for now. But that, that'll bring us to yeah, uh, I... the Galar region now. But go ahead, Stuart. Um, I, sorry, we just have to pause here. Um, you sent me the wrong photo. I did. Yeah, I just, I just want, yeah, I don't have the Gala, the Kento, it's last week's one. You see it now? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> and three. Let's chop that bit out. <laughs> All right. So go ahead and tell us how you feel about those rankings. Well, the Gala division is, you know, shaping up to be just as close as the Kanto one, which uh, I guess you could say was less expected. But um, it's good to see that Arizona Cardinals are the only team in the whole league that is still unbeaten after their resounding win. Mm -hmm. um, they're three and zero with a plus seven differential, which is well clear of the McKinsey Park Slowpokes, who are 2-1 and one with a plus-5 differential. Um, what's the team that's replacing the Crushing Silvalli, sorry? No, Crushing Silvalli's are still in the league. Oh, they're still there, of course. So they're 2-1 yeah. and one with a plus-4 differential. And you've got the uh, Virginia Victinis that are in fourth place that are also 2-1, and one, but they've only got a minus-2 differential. So that splits the top four. And then the um, bottom four teams are the Wishy Washies, which are one and two with a minus three differential. Um, the Fire Squirrels, which are one and two with a minus three differential. So those two teams are even. And then look at number seven, one and two with a minus three differential. So you got three teams in a row. Yeah, that's the Cornish Corfish who replaced the Memphis Maniacs. That's the one. And then um, in last place with 0 and 3 with a minus eight differential, you have the Rebellion. Who, you know, the Rebellion, they haven't even been playing that badly, to be honest, and yet they're yeah. in last place, which shows how competitive the thing is. Yeah, they've had great battles. I expect them to jump up a few games. Um, again, there's still five weeks to go, guys. There's still plenty of time for these lower-ranked teams to get to the high-ranked teams and the high-ranked teams to go back to the low-ranked teams. There, there's right. so much shuffling to go. Give it about three more weeks, and that's when you'll see what the cemented teams for playoffs will be. But for now, uh, Stuart, any last notes you have for these coaches coming to the week three recap? No, oh, well, you know, week four it looks like it's got some really good matchups. The Virginia Victinis and the Fire Squirrels are going to be wanting to get a, um, a foot above the other on the table. Same with the. Uh, the Cardinals, the Cardinals, sorry, are going to want to destroy their new competition, the Corfish, and retain that unbeaten record. Um, the Hoppers and Team Tempest, you know, both have had a couple of losses, so they're going to want to get in there and regain some of those um, points. And then you've got yourself, your first versus last there in the Kanto Division, so you'll be wanting to pull away by a clear win if you can. That is going to be an interesting battle, and I hope we can pull out a very big win on that one. Well, all right, that is our week three recap. I thank you again, Stuart J. Mills, for joining us for this week three recap. And we can't wait to see no you in week four. We'll be here with bells on. Ding, ding. <laughs> ding, ding. <laughs> You Same won't day. hear the last from us until the end of this season, guys. We are going to be re updating y'all on weekly recaps as well as playoff recaps and MVP race and everything else in store. So we will see you guys next time. Bye.